Good evening from the Robert F. and Gertrude L. Shook Music Recital Hall on the beautiful River Campus of Southeast Missouri State University. I am Doyle Privet, President of the University Board of Regents. On behalf of the Board, University President Dr. Ken Dobbins, faculty, staff, and students, I welcome you to the debate of the four candidates for the U.S. House of Representatives from Missouri's 8th Congressional District. Our moderator tonight is Dr. Thomas Hardy, Professor Emeritus of Speech Communication to Theater at Southeast. Dr. Hardy is a retired faculty member from the university where he was an award-winning professor, a nationally recognized debate coach, and chair of the Department of Speech Communication. He is currently a food journalist for the Southeast Missouri newspaper and host of several programs on the university's national public radio station, KRCU. Dr. Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Privet. It's been said that in a democracy like ours, a debate without a decision is preferable to a decision without a debate. Tonight's event is in keeping with that tradition, though the sponsors of this event hope that what transpires tonight might very well be helpful to you as you make one of the most important decisions citizens in a democracy can ever make, namely the question of who should represent you in the halls of government. And we're delighted that we have the four candidates who are vying for that honor from Missouri's 8th Congressional District with us here tonight to join in this debate and this exercise in democracy. Let me introduce them to you right now. First, we have uh, to my immediate left, Mr. Steve Hodges, mem uh, representing the Democratic Party. Next to him, we have Mr. Jason Smith from the Republican Party. Seated next to him, Mr. Doug Enyart of the Constitution Party. And finally, seated next to him, Mr. Bill Slants of the Libertarian Party. Now, before we begin the debate, let me just briefly go over the rules. Each candidate will have three minutes for an opening statement, and the order of those statements was predetermined by a random drawing which took place just a few minutes before we began, and the candidates, in fact, are seated in the order in which they drew. There will also be two-minute closing statements at the end of the debate. The order of those will begin with the two candidates who spoke last. Now, in between the opening and closing statements, of course, the candidates will submit two questions from our distinguished panel. Let me introduce them to you right now. First, we have uh, from KFES Heartland News, KFES 12 Heartland News, the anchor, Mr. Jeff Cunningham, and from the Southeast Missouri, and the editor, Mr. Bob Miller. Finally, uh, let me uh, tell you how the question and answer period will operate. Uh, each candidate will in turn be asked questions. The candidate to whom a question is originally directed will have two minutes to respond. Each of the other candidates in turn will have one minute to make a comment and we will rotate uh, those questions among the candidates starting with the candidate who gave the first opening statement. Finally, let me just remind the members of the audience that in order to keep as much time for the candidates as possible, we ask you to refrain from applause or uh, other audible reactions until the end of the debate. Finally, one more introduction uh, to make before we begin the debate. Uh, my colleague sitting next to me here, Mr. Bob Cherkio, is going to be our official timekeeper. So I think we're all ready for the debate, so let us begin. As you know, we'll start with opening statements in the order in which the panelists are seated. And so that means we'll begin with the first opening statement from Mr. Steve Hodges. You've got three minutes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hart. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Southeast Missouri State University, my alma mater, undergraduate alma mater, for hosting this event, along with KFES-TV and the Southeast Missourian and the Russ family. I think it's very important that uh, we have events like this to allow the public to view the candidates, to hear what their answers are on the issues, and to become informed voters. I'm running quite frankly because I think Washington has lost touch with small communities like ours. And I know what those like because I've lived it. For some reason we have a lack of common sense in Washington D.C. That's, that's evaded them in considering the people of Southeast Missouri in the 8th Congressional District. You know, when I had my grocery store that we operated as a family operation, I would have people come in with a handful of coupons trying to make their budgets stretch, trying to feed their families on a limited income. I don't think Washington, D.C. understands the problems of hardworking people like we have in our district. And there's also something completely illogical about a Congress that wastes too much time and too much of our tax money and then tries to balance a budget by slashing programs like Social Security and Medicare, two vital government programs that are very important to a vital 
and vulnerable part of our population, that being middle-income families, the handicapped, and seniors. Now this won't help the family that has those 30 cent coupons, but I'm running because the people of Southeast Missouri delete, deserve a government that responds to them and is not a hindrance to them. Since serving in Jefferson City, I've been known as a consensus builder. I've crossed the aisle to work with members of the opposition party to get some common ground. I think that's important. I think that's what America would like to see. I've worked with Republicans and Governor Nixon to keep a balanced budget without raising taxes and without offering additional burdens on our seniors. I think this is the same common sense approach that should be taken to Washington, D.C., and that's what I plan to do once I'm elected. My name is Steve Hodges, and I appreciate your vote on August, I'm sorry, on June 4th. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hodges. Our next opening statement for three minutes will be from Mr. Jason Smith. Thank you. It's, it's truly great to be here tonight. I want to thank the Southeast Missourian and the Russ family, KFBS 12, and also Southeast, um, Southeast Missouri State for hosting this event. It's truly an honor to be able to bring forward our conservative message across all 30 counties. This is a great district. It's made up of 30 counties ranging from 40 miles south of, of St. Louis City to 40 miles east of Springfield. It's, a, it's the most diversified agriculture district outside the state of California. We grow everything but citrus and rice here. You know, I'm, I'm just from, from the hill country west of here. I grew up in a small town, less than 5,000 people. My father was an auto mechanic and my mother worked in a factory. The values they taught me of of hard work and perseverance and, and fighting for what is right are the values that, that this district holds. They're clearly priceless. You know, I'm running for Congress because I'm, I'm tired of watching Washington, D.C. continue to kick the can down the road. They genuinely don't solve the problems at hand, whether it's balancing the budget, let alone passing a budget. You know, Congress hasn't passed a budget in over 1,400 days let alone balance a budget, but only five times in the last 56 years. People don't want that. Southeast Missouri, Southern Missouri, wants Washington, D.C. to look a lot more like the state of Missouri. In the state of Missouri, for the last eight years, I have fought wasteful spending and fought to balance a budget without ever increasing taxes. In fact, I co-sponsored legislation to reduce the, the double taxation on Social Security benefits to our seniors. Folks, I have fought to stop wasteful spending. I have fought to reduce burdensome regulation on family farmers and individuals. There are over 170,000 pages of rules and regulations at the federal government. We need to reduce these burdensome regulations, get government off the back of small businesses and family farmers, and allow them to grow and prosper. We need to repeal Obamacare. Obamacare, for one, took billions of dollars out of Medicare. Folks, that's a problem. That's hurting the folks here in Southeast Missouri and Southern Missouri. I know what it's like to live on a farm. I'm the fourth generation owner of our family farm. I know what it's like to balance a budget and live within its means. I'm a small business owner. I also know what it's like to sign the front of a paycheck rather than just the back of it. We need more of that in Washington. Looking forward to, to all the questions, and I'm asking for your vote on June 4th. All right, thank you, Mr. Smith. The next three-minute opening statement will be from Mr. Enyart. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for spending your time coming out here and listening to us. Thank you for those at home who are watching. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been crisscrossing this district ever since this campaign began, and I've been listening to people in small groups, sometimes just a half a dozen in place. And I can tell you, I'm hearing one common refrain, that people are frustrated with their government. They're frustrated with the two parties who have delivered us into this sorry state of affairs. And they're talking to me. Some of them have historically been Democrats. Some of them have been historically Republicans. The two major parties have dominated the political landscape for as long as any of us can remember, for 150 years. And we're supposed to believe that they're going to fix it? No, I think, I think not. Ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to go down a different path, it's going to take a different party. 
we're going to have to really make some different decisions other than what we've had in the past. We're going to have to make a decision other than Coke or Pepsi. We're going to have to make a decision other than one side of the coin or the other. Because the, the truth is, there's not that much difference between them. They're all part and parcel of the same corporatocracy that's in charge of our government. We need to take it back. We, the people, have got to stand up and do something different. We've got to take back this country. We need a constitutionally limited government. The Constitution Party stands on the solid foundation of the Constitution, and the Constitution itself stands on the solid foundation of natural law, God's law. We are endowed by our Creator with inalienable rights, or unalienable, as some of the groups like to put it that I've been talking to, groups that some of these folks haven't gone and talked to. Those are the folks that I've been talking to, and they're sending a message loud and clear. They're tired of it. They're ready for change. I'm asking the people at home, I'm asking everyone in the, within the reach of my voice, vote for the Constitution. I will carry the message. We need more choices. They need more competition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anyard. And the final three-minute opening statement then will come from Mr. Slats. Thank you. After three decades of Republican rule, the 8th District is in terrible shape. It's the poorest district in the state and one of the poorest districts in the nation. The family farm has never faced such adversity thanks to special interest projects like the special interest pet projects like the Farm Bill and big ag subsidies. We need real solutions. We need someone in office who will actually stand behind those solutions. We do not need Emerson 3.0. The same people that are responsible for crafting cronious schemes like the Monsanto Protection Act are now putting their support behind my opponent, Jason Smith. The two-party system has sold this district out to special interest, and I cannot stand by and allow the abuse of power. The Democrat and Republican, I am not a Democrat or Republican, I am a Libertarian, and when I say I'll stand for freedom and limited government, I actually mean it. Through my eyes, there is very little difference between a Democrat and a Republican. Ultimately, they believe big government can solve our problems. You may hear statements that talk about balancing the budget or reducing spending increases, and I'm here to tell you simply that that will not and is not going to happen under this present state of Congress. Today's Congress can't balance the budget because they're unwilling to make the changes necessary to do so. Simply, we are spending $3.5 trillion a year and only bringing in $2.5 trillion a year. We are upside down by $1 trillion. That is $10,000 for each American family. So in order to balance the budget, we either need to take another $10,000 from each family, or we need to cut spending. I don't know about you, but I'm for cutting the spending. Neither the Democrats nor the Republicans are willing to do that, because that would mean an end to the relationships, the ones who prop them up, the special interest. Throughout the evening, you'll hear hyperbole about what needs fixing. I will be the only one offering real solutions. <clears throat> do you know what I, <clears throat> those, there are many reasons the government is dysfunctional and not working for you. Three big ones stick out to me. It's the lawyers. The large majority of Congress is made up of attorneys. It's the lobbyist and the special interest and the money and the power grab. I'm not going to sit here and complain without offering you some remedies on how to fix it. Let's elect non-lawyers, regular citizens, business people. Let's get rid of the lobbyists and the special interest by deregulating, defunding. This removes all the fuel and then out the door goes the money and the power grab. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Slants. There are your opening statements. Now it's time for questions. As you know, we'll begin with the candidate who had the first opening speech. He, each candidate who uh, has a question directly addressed to him will get two minutes to respond. The other candidates, in turn, will have one minute to comment. And the questions, of course, will come from our panel. Mr. Cunningham, do you have the first question? That's right. Gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. As you heard, our first question will be directed to Mr. Hodges. It concerns Social Security. 
Mr. Hodges, you said you don't want to cut Social Security benefits to seniors. The government stated that Social Security trust funds will become exhausted as soon as 2033. So the question, what changes do you feel are necessary to ensure the long-term viability of Social Security? Social Security is one of the most important issues for the people of Southeast Missouri. Over half of American seniors depend on Social Security benefits for their income. My parents are both 86. That's the only source of income that they have. They depend on that to pay their bills. I think that we must preserve the Social Security program, find ways to fund it, they're efficient, and anything past that is non-negotiable. My opponent, Mr. Smith, would probably be a proponent for voting for the Ryan budget. All the Republicans in the House voted for it. The Ryan budget would take Social Security and gut it, and perhaps privatize it. It would also take Medicare and make changes in it that would put an additional $6,400 per person, a cost to seniors who can't afford to live right now. The average family in the 8th Congressional District makes $36,000. That doesn't stretch very far. Again, I will support Social Security and Medicare to the end, and I will work in Congress to make sure that viable alternatives are developed. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, do you have a comment? Yes, uh, I, I'm actually, thank you for asking that question. Um, uh, as, as Mr. Hodges referred to, he said my opponent probably, he wasn't for sure of where I am on this position, but um, he's tried to make a position for me. My parents are both on Social Security. Do you imagine if, if I would support something to dismantle Social Security, I would not be invited to Thanksgiving dinner, I can tell you that. But um, I believe we have promises made to our seniors. You know, people 50 years and above, let's say that example, um, they've paid into the system their entire life. Government should not dismantle and take it away. You know, but people that are my age, we're gonna to have to do something differently because it's not gonna be there. Every report shows it's not there, but we have to maintain and keep the promises to the seniors that have relied on it their entire life and, and negative campaign ads don't work for me. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anyard, do you have a comment? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the process. Uh, you have one minute to respond to the uh, question or to the uh, answers which the other candidates have made. Well, so you I'll have one I'll minute respond to respond to the question. The question is, what, what are we going to do about security, Social Security? The, per, the, the fad, sad truth is Social Security is headed for the cliff. Two, fe two people working for every person that, that's, that's already retired just simply doesn't work. Social Security was fundamentally flawed from the beginning. Populations don't rise at a steady state. When they put Social Security together, they didn't foresee the baby boom. But this is a natural flow of things, always. Populations boom and then they fall. It has always been that way. Again, two people working for every person that's, that's retired just simply doesn't work, especially when you take into consideration all the other taxes they're going to have to be paying, like my grandchildren sitting right here beside me. They're being labeled the tax paying generation. They can't support me and the taxes that we're putting on them every day. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Slants, do you have a comment? My view on Social Security is a little more ominous. I'm not as bad as people think. Those who have paid into the Social Security system need to be able to take out what they've put in. No questions asked. But Social Security needs to be phased out completely and replaced with a private system that people can be encouraged to enter into as they enter the workforce. No one who's contributed to Social Security should be deprived of the Social Security. But in my viewpoint, its life has lived and it's time to uh, phase it out entirely. Those who are entering the workforce today should not participate in Social Security and not take Social Security ben benefits. All right, thank you very much. The next question will go to Mr. Smith and it will come from Mr. Miller. Good evening. Good evening. There was a lot of talk in the uh, opening statements 
uh, about the uh, federal deficit. So Mr. Smith, could you elaborate on your plans to get the federal deficit under control? When you look at the federal deficit, we're facing over $16.4 trillion of debt. That's more than $53,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. Our biggest issue facing the United States is our, is our fiscal irresponsibility. The last thing we need to do is to look like the country of Greece. We're going to have to clearly get down to the basics and truly first pass a budget. Like I said, we haven't passed a budget in 1,400 days. We need to balance a budget, but we need to first pass a budget. When you're looking at wasteful spending, the fact that we spent $41,000 a piece for every new toilet in Denali National Park in Alaska is ridiculous. This is the kind of wasteful spending you see. We have 2.8 million federal employees. 500,000 of those federal employees make over $100,000 a year. Folks, there's waste throughout the federal government in numerous areas. Let's start looking at the different agencies. I would be very supportive of, of eliminating, eliminating the EPA because the EPA is eliminating jobs in the 8th Congressional District and they need to get off our backs and allow our businesses to grow and allow our farmers to survive. Okay, thank you. Mr. Anyard, you have one minute for a comment if you'd like. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the federal debt is the, the biggest reason, or the second biggest reason, next to my grandchildren, I got into this race. We're spending more than we can, than we can sustain. We're borrowing 40 to 46 cents on every dollar that the government spends. I'm the only candidate that's sitting before you who has worked both as an employee and as a contractor for state and federal agencies. I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt there is waste at every level. There is even waste at the county level. We have plenty of cutting to do. We can cut a lot and still have plenty of, of, of the, the essential government services. But on that, that note right there, we have a lot of government we really don't need. Mr. Smith said he'd get rid of the EPA. Well, I got another target in my crosshairs. That's Department of Homeland Security and TSA. There's two of them. We haven't had them that long. They can easily be gotten rid of quickly, overnight. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Slants, you have one minute for a response. Agreed completely, Doug. <clears throat> you want spending cuts? I'll give you spending cuts. If elected, I'll immediately sponsor legislation to eliminate the Department of Homeland Security. They have served their purpose. Also, the TSA, let the airlines take care of their own security, as well as the EPA, the DEA, and the IRS. I will immediately sponsor legislation to cut every budget of every other federal agency by 10% each year for the next four years. The military should re remain strong and state-of-the-art. It should be adequate to defend against all, all enemies. However, the United States cannot afford the cost in blood and money of maintaining a global empire. We need to stop the occupation of other countries and close every foreign military base. This would put $12,000 into the pocket of every family. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Hodges, you have one minute. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, this is on the particular question that's been asked, but uh, uh, Jason, I just want to share with you, yes, Missouri is a rice producing state. We happen to be one of the fourth leading rice producers in the nation. Uh, I say that in all fairness to uh, my friends down in uh, Stoddard County, Pemscott County. Anyway, um, just as I did in my grocery store, I went around on a daily basis, daily basis looking for efficiencies and inefficiencies. We would audit operations, audit the costs that we had associated. I think we have to put an emphasis on that. Government is nothing more than big business. I think that we should work toward a balanced budget. I'm very much in favor of that. It's not going to happen overnight because we've waited way too long to solve this deficit problem. But that would be my approach to use common sense, make good, tough business decisions as we have in the state of Missouri with Governor Nixon's leadership. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. The next question will go to Mr. Enyart, and it will come from Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Inyard, representing the Constitution Party, this question concerns the Constitution. Ever since the school shooting in Connecticut, there's been fierce debate about the Second Amendment. Other amendments, though, have been caught in the crossfire, like restricting violence in video games and movies, which would restrict the First Amendment. 
Later, the issue of not reading Miranda rights to a U.S. citizen and suspected terrorist, which deals with the Sixth Amendment. Do you feel that some constitutional rights are more important than others or are attacked more than others? How would you seek to protect those rights? Well, I would certainly agree that some, some of our constitutional rights are certainly attacked more than others, but the Constitution must remain intact for all of us, completely, all of our rights. We have to remember that the Constitution doesn't give us our rights. We already had those rights. The Constitution bears a memorial to those rights. And the, the, the founders put the most important ones in their Bill of Rights. They thought it was important because they thought that somewhere down the road, somebody would get the bright idea of taking those rights away from us. But in fact, the very Bill of Rights has been used against us. We have the right of the freedom of speech, but then where did hate crimes come from? Where's that, where does that fit in? We have, we have the freedom of a religion, but our pastors have been muzzled through legislation. One of the pieces of legislation that I'll be writing is to give pastors their voice back so they won't have to be scared of losing their 501c3 status. The Constitution is a memorial, as I said, and in relationship to the, the shootings, we have people problems. Guns don't shoot people by themselves, it's people. And in fact, more people are killed by cars than guns all the time. Why did the founders put the Second Amendment in there in the first place? They didn't put it in there so they could hunt. At that, in, those, in those days, everybody hunted. It was just common. Why did they, did they put it in there so that you could defend your home? No, that was pretty common too. No, the founders put that in there in the Constitution and they put it listed at number two, the number two position because they knew that somewhere down the road, the government that they created may be used against us. They knew that we would have to have the ability to resist tyranny, just as we did during their time. Okay, thank you. Mr. Slance, you have one minute for a response. The Second Amendment should be, remain untouched. The private ownership and use of firearms or other weapons in a non-invasive way is fully legitimate. Government regulation, licensing, and registration should be abolished. In fact, no guns or ammunition should ever be taxed. Guns are essential for private citizens to protect themselves, but most importantly, against an oppressive government. The NRA is not the champion of the Second Amendment that has claimed itself to be. To me, it's just another lobbying group, and its life is short-lived. I respect the National Association of Gun Rights and Gun Owners of America. I'm the only candidate here who is 100% uncompromising in my defense of the Second Amendment. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hodges, you have one minute for a comment. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I am an NRA member, and I have unwavering support for the Second Amendment. This is something especially, not only nationwide, especially in our particular district, we, we have hunters, we have hobbyists, we have target shooters, we have collectors of guns. And I want to go on record as saying I think uh, President Obama has been wrong in some of the legislation that he has introduced concerning gun control. I think what he is looking at is trying to find a quick fix for a very minute portion of our population that has caused these troubles, those the mentally ill, and the professional criminals. And I don't think that we should penalize the entire population just for the acts of a few. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, your comment? President Obama has been wrong on all pieces of gun restriction le legislation that he's introduced, not some, all. In regards to the Second Amendment, I'm a lifetime member of the NRA and the only candidate on this panel that has in, in, been endorsed solely by the National Rifle Association. When you're talking about the Constitution of the United States, it's all of it. You can't pick and choose what sections you like, whether it's the First Amendment, Second Amendment, or Tenth Amendment. Um, apparently, our president, when he doesn't like a particular area, whether it's freedom of press, as subpoenaing, subpoenaing AP reporters' phone records, we can see how the president continues to attack our constitutional rights. I can tell you right now, I will stand up to the president and fight him tooth and nail in every aspect he's trying to eliminate and destroy our constitutional rights. Okay, thank you. The next question will go to Mr. Slance and it will come from Mr. Miller. 
Good evening. Mr. Slancer, you have stated your preference for deregulation, particularly in agriculture. Could you name specifically some regulations you would like to see lifted from farmers? And secondly, do you support farming subsidies as part of the crop insurance program? The Boot Hill gets its lion's share of government handouts and remains the poorest of the poor in the district. Who's benefiting from all these farm subsidies? The top 10% of the corporate farmers receive 80% of all farm subsidies. Subsidies raise the price of farmland. In a free market, we can let farmers grow and raise what makes sense to them and let consumers buy what they want. Let the Monsanto bought and paid for bureaucrats get them out of policy making. The U.S. has an absolute competitive edge over the rest of the world. Taxpayers should not be subsidizing it. End the subsidies, end the welfare, let the people farm. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hodges, your turn for a comment. Well, this is certainly one of my favorite to topics, agriculture. I think it's an absolute shame that Congress has not approved a farm bill up to this date. Economically, agriculture is the driving engine behind the state of Missouri and especially southeast Missouri. We can go down there and we can see all kinds of different farming operations going on. And the day that you walk into a grocery store and can't get any food because farmers have gone out of business and they can't produce, then it's going to really hit home. You know, a lot of our constituency thinks that's where food comes from, the grocery store. But if you not lived the life of a farmer, and my father-in-law was one, and my father was one for a period of his life, I think that all these programs are very important to support agriculture, and I will be a supporter of agriculture. That will be one of the first committees that I ask to be assigned to. Okay, thank you. Mr. Smith, a comment? I don't have to tour a farm to understand agriculture. It's, it's our way of life in Dent County. You know, folks, when you're talking about protecting agriculture, I've done that in the Missouri House. I passed the constitutional amendment that took several years to do that, that everyone will be able to vote on in November of 2014 in the state of Missouri to put in the Bill of Rights the protection that farmers will always be able to farm and ranch and it will not be restricted against environmentalists and animal rights activists that tend to target the way of life, the rural way of life. In regards to regulations, I passed House Bill 1135 last year that put a systematic review process in reviewing all rules and regulations to make sure they don't cause an undue burden on small businesses, family farmers, individuals. These are the kind of policies we need. If you're, the question was, what rules and regulations would you, would you get rid of? I would start with the 20,000 new rules that's trying to implement Obamacare. That's a good place to start. Okay, Mr. Anyard, you have one minute for a response. Thank you. The, the farm bill, sub, government subsidies and farming, I, I also get involved in this in my professional life. We were talking about a $17 trillion deficit earlier and what we were going to do about cutting the, def, cutting the, the spending and, and balancing the budget. I would include the farm bill and the government subsidies for farmers in the, the ways that we can begin cutting. Now, there's sections of the farm bill that you may not even be aware of, sections for conservation. This is where I live and work. This is where I built my business. So a lot of my clients use these programs. Right now, we're, we're borrowing, again, 40 to 46 cents on every dollar that the federal government is spending. It's not worth some wealthy landowner's uh, welfare to give them a food plot or wildlife pond for my, my grandkids to pay for. That's my take on it. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. We're back to Mr. Hodges uh, for the next question, and it will come from Mr. Cunningham. Mr. Hodges, you're uh, campaigning as a conservative Democrat, and I know one of the areas in which you agree with uh, Republicans is uh, gun rights. Given the uh, horrific mass shootings uh, in the United States, not the least of which in Newtown, Connecticut, would you be in favor of more stringent background checks? And if not, what are the appropriate <clears throat> steps to limit or eliminate school shootings? Well, uh, Jeff, we already have a number of laws on the books. We already have a number of laws on the books that we're not enforcing about gun control. 
I think that uh, certainly all of us are saddened by all of those events, those terrible events. What kind of people commit those acts? But yet, I think we need to uh, make less legislation and, and, and enforce legislation that we already have. Adding more bills, adding more red tape is not the way to do it. That's what people don't want. People don't want additional regulation. And certainly as an advocate for gun control, I am, as an advocate for Second Amendment rights, I will favor that. All right, thank you. Mr. Smith, you have a minute for a response. Clearly, the, the shootings were tragic and awful, but the policies that Obama has brought forth in gun control are unacceptable. You know, it's not only depriving our freedoms and our constitutional rights, it takes away our jobs in the 8th Congressional District. If you know the district, you would know in Shannon County, Missouri, in Somersville, we manufacture the parts of, of, of a semi-automatic weapon that the Democrats in Congress have tried to ban. But not only do we manufacture the parts of that semi-automatic weapon in Somersville, Missouri, we put that gun together in southern Jefferson County in Festus. Folks, when we have liberals in Congress trying to target our constitutional freedoms, they're also trying to ban our jobs and make more people unemployed. You lose, you lose 55 jobs in Shannon County, Missouri, or you lose 300 jobs in Jefferson County, that directly affects us and our way of life, and I will stand up to Nancy Pelosi and Barack Obama every step of the way. Okay, Mr. Enyart, do you have a comment for one minute? Every time something bad happens, and there's always throughout human history been bad things happen, but every time something bad happens in our nation, there's those elements within our government that want to pass a law. Well, every law sets limits on somebody. And every law that's passed has unintended consequences. Every law, while it may sound flowery on the, on the title, it may sound like a good idea at the time, we get down the road and then, oops, we figured out, oh, maybe that wasn't really such a good idea. That's how we arrived at this situation. We have laws for everything. We have laws that, that limit the kind of gas can spouch that you can buy it down at Walmart, for crying out loud. We have too many laws. Let's change direction. Let's start turning the ship around and going the other way and taking laws off the books. That's what I intend to do when I get to Congress. I'll be writing legislation aimed at the government, but not at the people. Thank you. And Mr. Schlantz, you have one minute to respond. School shootings and bombings in Boston are horrible and horrific things. They're heinous, they're awful, these people who carry these acts out. You have to question yourself or ask yourself sometimes why, what's in the mind of a person who, who, would, who, would, uh, who would do these things. And Doug is right. We don't want a knee-jerk reaction each and every time one of these tragic things happened. We need to have a stable and steady hand. I've said earlier, and I'll state it again, the government regulation, licensing, and registration of guns should be abolished. No, in fact, no guns or ammunition should ever be taxed. I'm in favor of encouraging our young folk to be more secure in their being, not restrict them or, or, or burden them with unnecessary policies. All right, thank you. The next question will go to Mr. Smith, and it will come from Mr. Miller. Hello. Mr. Smith, you, have, uh, you and many others have said that the recipe for economic growth is lower taxes and fewer regulations. The stock market is experiencing a strong rebound and productivity is increasing yet the unemployment and underemployment rates remain stagnant. How confident are you that tax breaks and deregulation will improve the unemployment situation in the United States? You know, for one, government doesn't create jobs. Government creates an environment that allows jobs to grow. And our economy is starting to head in the right direction in spite of President Obama and his policies. Without a doubt, I, I have full certainty that if you reduce taxes, you reduce regulation, businesses will grow. While traveling across this district, one thing that I hear over and over and over again are businesses that, whether they have 55, 56, 57 employees, 
they are going to reduce those employees because they are scared of the implement, implement, implementation of Obamacare. So they're going to get below the 50 window. Folks, those are real jobs. That's proof that government regulation destroys jobs. You know, we're seeing it. I know of a restaurant owner that owned two restaurants, but he just sold one of them so he would fall below the 50 window mark. We do not need to allow government to disincentivize growth. I visited a company in Cape Girardeau today. They have 45 employees. It's a distributorship. And you know what they told me? We're going to make sure we don't hit that 50 mark. Even if they need it, they're going to find a way not to get it. That's because of government regulation. That's why we have to reduce government regulation. We have the largest corporate tax in the world. That makes, it, makes us where we cannot compete globally. Folks, we have to reduce the taxes, reduce regulation, and just let government get off the backs of small business owners, family farmers, and individuals. Mr. Rainyard, your turn for a one-minute response. Ladies and gentlemen, I said this last week at the candidate forum. I'm going to say it again here, again, so that folks at home can, can hear me. You're going to hear a lot of similar and, and same answers from mostly the, my, all of us. You, you really need to do some work this time. You're going to have to look at us deeply and analyze us. Put us in the, your, your search engine, Google us. Look for the breadth and depth of our experience. We're all going to tell you that we need to reduce regulations on, on small businesses. Small businesses where the jobs are created, not the mega corporations. And while it, the, you hear a lot of flowery speech out of the major the parties that are sitting here, what's the real result? What have they done for the last 150 years? How did we get to this position? How do we get so many regulations? Well, we, we got so many regulations by sending attorneys to, to Washington. We got so many regulations by sending career politicians to Washington. Thank you. Mr. Slanch, you have one minute for a comment. A lot of us talk about our jobs being outsourced, and we're outraged by that. But jobs are easily outsourced. Our government fails to recognize that capital and jobs will move around the globe at the speed of light and will not stay where they're penalized by excessive taxation or regulation. Stop taxing. Stop regulating. We need less regulation. We sh failing that, we should not regulate small businesses in the same fashion that we regulate big corporations.